Okay, with that said, who's first? Okay, first hand up, right back there. Come on. Great, thank you. I might just stay here. It's all right, right? Yeah, that's fine. That's your good side, right? Here. Yeah. Before we start, you, I, it's clear, and we didn't do this at all, you should announce your name, because there's a lot of people that don't know you, okay. and what you're playing. And, and uh, if it's a standard, it should be cool. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Akira Okamoto. I'll be playing uh, Charlie A6. Okay, two things wrong with that, sorry. <laughs> our trumpet is our pacifier, as you will all find out. That sometimes standing and talking in front of people, um, you know, we do that, don't we? You did too. Yeah. And you don't have to point at them. Oh, okay. Just be yourself. Yeah. In fact, it would be really good if you just maybe got rid of this for a second. Okay. And then say the same thing. Hello, my name is Akira Okamoto, and I'll be playing Shorty the Six. That's great. Then you don't involve this little thing, which okay. seems to be. <laughs> thank you, dear, for helping me. <laughs> thank you. That's a good place to stop. Beautiful, wonderful, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Anyway, a lot of beautiful stuff in there. Thank you. Um, okay, that's a, that's a section that's done uh, for auditions, especially some of the military bands now, so that's a good stopping point. Um, one of the problems with the Charliers is these, these things are long. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, you all probably know a little bit about Charlier, hopefully. Uh, he was a wonderful trumpet player. He probably didn't know that he died the year I was born. So I figure, Charlie ate Charlie. He's got a <laughs> Not kidding, I went through that, but it didn't, you know, it didn't bother too much. But, um, he was a wonderful player, and uh, do you know when he was born? No, I don't. Okay, it's like, probably not in this book. So again, if somebody would email me, well, that's actually, actually in the ITG thing, there's uh, a whole explanation uh, sheets of information, and I can send some of that. ITG did the errata, the mistakes, and uh, somebody's uh, suggestions. I can't remember who that was, but uh, that's all really valuable. A translation of all these pages, right. which is really pretty cool, too. Yeah. At any rate, uh, he could play this. And it, it brings something to mind, I'm just going to say to you, and that is, if we learn, there's three ways we can be mu more musical. Really important, three ways. So I'm glad you're all writing this down. Oh, somebody, he's somebody, okay, get notes. Get, anybody that's writing this down, get their notes. Three ways of being more musical. How many of you were asked sometime in high school and you're playing a little solo with the, the, the band's got a, a piece and there's a little solo and the conductor stops and says, play that more musically. And then we go on and talk to something else and you're wondering like, what does he mean by that? The conductor should never say that because 
That's what we're trying to learn to do, is be more musical. Um, okay, there's no order to these things, but one way of being more musical is learning and disciplining yourself to play what's on the page. And you know there's so many things that are weird, like those little Vs, right? right? Uh, and, and he says in number one, uh, he says over here, the first time that V he uses it, he puts a little asterisk or a little footnote. And it says right here, in French, and I'm not going to try to say it, <laughs> but he basically says the sign V indicates a respiration. And of course it's not a breath. Because you, look, look at Charlie too, his second one. Right here, you finish the second line, ba da 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 dee da ba da Da, you don't need a breath. Right. There you go. Right. That's a phrasing. In fact, here, how do you say your name? Okara? Akira. Akira. Yes. That's exactly what's going on here. Akira, <laughs> let's go out and get a little beer. Da, 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 da. <laughs> it's like saying, hey, you. It's a greeting. That's all that is. He's being vocal here. He's singing. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing goes here. What an odd place. So it's not, a, it's not a respiration. It's a breath. It is a breath. But it's a musical breath. So those are odd. I'm just saying that the, there's a number of they, he uses them throughout the whole book, right? Mm -hmm. But also, he, there's another thing very interesting that he does. Half of the pieces, there's 36 transcendental. I'm not quite sure mm -hmm. uh, what that means, but uh, they're very interesting. It's probably the best musical AT book we have, music. And as you probably know, a number of people use, will use this as an unaccompanied soul for recital. Uh, some piece in here. Uh, Jeff Biancolano, who was in San Francisco, his recital, he played number two. He, that's all he wanted. He loved that piece so much, he insisted. And that's the main say in my recital. Okay? And, and I, I totally agree. They're full of music. So we could be more musical if we would learn to try to adhere and get some of his ideas, because okay. I guarantee you he was a better musician than any of us in this room, for sure. Me included. So I've learned tremendous things. Uh, about what he writes. Now, there's not a lot done. The first thing, I'll get to the other two, I promised, but somebody has to remind me. Two other ways of being more musical. But the first one is the discipline of playing what's on the page. If we play something like the original Brad book, for example, uh, the original one, not the one that was uh, done by um, um, Bob, who was in the New York Brass Quintet, uh, Robert Nagel. Didn't he uh, edit that? Yeah, Robert Nagel edited it, and it's put out by International, and uh, anybody could edit these books. I don't like to do that one, because he's telling me I should, how I should do it his way. Mm -hmm. So I liked Brent's, that there was nothing there. There's hardly any dynamics, and it forces us to be creative, and we have to use other tools to be more musical. That's my point. Whereas Charlier is very literal, like Mahler. You want to study Mahler? You want to be a conductor? Just follow his rules. It's amazing. And Mahler tells you how to conduct everything. What speed, what to do. There's letters written all the way through. I mean, you, you, we know it on the parts. Um, half of the pieces in this 30, book of 36, um, 18 of them, exactly, do not give a dynamic at the beginning. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if you've ever thought how interesting that. Half of them, he, he just, in this one he says Dolce. That's all, he's leaving it to the performer, based on sometimes what comes up next. Sans force, number one. Mezzo forte, number two. Famous number two. Mezzo forte, number three. We could go on. Firamento, it's not forte. Firamento, what does that mean? You gotta know these, right? right. You probably do, hope so. Nothing on that one. Oh yeah, mezzo forte. Dolce on here, so it's almost half and half. Sans force, good old Ben Cantabile, right? Ben Cantabile, number eight. Leggero, number nine. Dolce, number 10. In there, that's why it's not forte in Firmento, because right. mezzo forte in Firmento. Here's one of the oddest ones. Number 16. Grab this one. Dolce. Guess what we have? Yum ticka ticka dum ticka ticka dum ticka ticka dum ticka ticka dum. Puts a different kind of spin on what dolce means. So I go, yum digga digga dum digga digga dum digga digga da digga digga da digga digga dum digga. It's the only thing I could think of to do. It's not a misprint. He's trying to give you, he was almost challenging. Okay, so that is one way of being more musical. 
And you cer certainly could do that. You almost go overboard and sometimes, it, it, I, I felt like I was in a, a bathtub in the ocean being rocked back and forth. Mm -hmm. You have to give us a little bit of stability into okay. what, the, how, what the speed might be with, just like we talk, I mean, look at me, too. I'm just racing and then I slow down. And if I want to say something important, like Akira, the, the biggest thing, the biggest problem in your plane is, you know, <laughs> that doesn't help me at all. Sometimes right. we're playing really softly, you know, it doesn't mean anything. So first dynamic is a piano, so you don't want to start piano probably. Mm -hmm. But everything else is key. Got a crescendo here. This could be a little bit more evened out, ironed out, so it wasn't so abrupt in yeah. some of your things. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk more things about it, but I wanted to tell the other two ways of being more musical. I talked about peaks, searching for the peaks. When you're playing alone, essential. You never just play a straight line. Music is not that way. Music is expressive, just like it is when we talk. And what do we do to vary a piece? To go to a peak, we use dynamics. It's the easiest one. Dynamics is the, it's a cheap tool. It's so easy to play louder to get people's attention and to play very <clears throat> I got your attention. Dynamics, that's an effect. Dynamics are an effect. And it's the easiest tool we could use. Speed. Certainly, intensity of sound with use of vibrato, articulation, and varying articulation like these three dudes that played the Brahms. Um, uh, it, it was sort of the wrong articulation. We, as classical players, and certainly jazz players, use multiple articulations. Anybody that studied the early era of the 18th, 19th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, you'll notice they, there are treatises that they used articulations almost everything you could say with your mouth, especially cornetto, but even the trumpets. And it was one of their ways of being able to tune some of those parcels that were out of tune, was having a different articulation. We don't just use two. How unimaginative is that? And so, do is a very good, goo, the jazz player, foo. Why not? You want to be more expressive, we use articulation. So going toward a peak, we may change articulation if we're going to that peak. Da, 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 da. It's not even printed that way, but it would be expressive that way. Speed for sure. So those are just some of the tools we might use. Looking for the peaks. So let me be more specific. Pines of Rome offstage solo is a classic. Every two measures in Pines of Rome, if anybody has it and wants to look at it real fast, every two measures there are two peaks. And I don't think we'll disagree, but I think I said earlier, we can disagree on where peaks are. Like I, I said, okay, you can get away with putting the peak of the high drum of the Gerald, the third note, not having that as a peak. Most people think of it, bong, bong, bong. But I think that's a peak. Um, where's the first peak in here? I'd say, um, G? No. no. There's one sooner. B, B simply. The second note. No. How about the fourth note? Fourth note. Beginning of the second measure. Okay. Here you might go, but it's your choice, mm -hmm. and that's what makes music so wonderful. But right. you have to sound like you're doing something. You you had a, a natural use of peaks. I'm not going to bother you, but okay. in the Pines of Rome, listen to this. There's three reasons for peaks. I think I started to say that this morning. The high note. First beat, I did say it. First beat of a measure and a dissonance. In Pine to Rome, there are two high notes. There's one of them. La da da ya da da ya da. What is that peak? What is that? Dissonance. That's the dissonance. It's called an accented appoggiatura. It's like a grace note, but it's on the beat. Ya da. Every two measures has two peaks, except for two high notes. All the rest are appoggiaturas. And, and, and you can sit on those, and you should go to those. And immediately, as soon as, as soon as you play through it once, you can go through the whole thing and put an X. Remember, two in every measure 
all of a sudden the piece has shape. Now other people can get away with not doing those, but if you want to have a guarantee how you can make the piece sound like, like the rhythm's correct, mm -hmm. because Pines are all off stage. It probably says Cantabile on it, right? It, it, or Espresivo or something like that. Dolce, it says something that suggests that this is not an etude, but it, it's, it's a vocalizing piece. So that gives you the right, true or false, of being flexible with your time. Careful. Mm. I do a couple <laughs> of tricky questions there. Well, look at it this way. Is music uh, rigid? I mean, is it metronomical? Is, met is it? Yeah. I when was the metronome first used? What composer used it, thought he was going to make some money on it? Anybody know? <gasps> Beethoven. So that meant music was terrible before that? No. Bach was terrible because he didn't use it. He didn't think metronomically. Metronome is almost uh, uh, an enemy of us, except that it should be used to show us our weaknesses, where we rush and drag. But sitting down and playing something like this, or that pines alone with a metronome, should be shot, <laughs> probably, you know. So, um, no, music for sure is flexible. And we can use those peaks to help us stretch. A singer, what, what's the reputation of singers? How do conductors feel about singers? We don't have time. They don't have time. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Their time is better than ours. You know why? They know the text. They know what's important. They take liberties that really bug conductors. Because the conductor has to keep the orchestra going. But the singer is going to go, Conductor's going, come on, my dear, I have to go on. No, that's what's there. Music is not metronomical, and especially in singing pieces. Let yourself be more free. It's the biggest problem of all of you in this room, is that you are brought up by the Almighty Beat, the band. You know, and what do they do in bands? They'll cheat the last note of a phrase so they don't lose any time. That's terrible! So thanks for answering that, what you thought was correct, because that's the reputation, and you're absolutely right. But if we would elongate these things. OK, so uh, Daniel Barrymore, I, I knew him quite well. He was a guest uh, when I was in Chicago Symphony. Um, my years in Chicago Symphony, I, got, I was hired by Jean Martinon, not Schulte. So I saw Schulte come two years later. I saw his first 10 years. That was quite a trip. Okay, Barenboim came in as a guest, and then he becomes music director. And I had played for him a couple times when Hurst had had quadruple uh, heart surgery. Uh, there was a tour to Japan, and so I spent four years and never played one note for his trumpet. I mean, 12 years. And, and you know, I never played one note. I was fourth trumpet and second trumpet. But now I go on this tour, and I'm splitting the book with Mark Reidenauer. That was pretty cool. Um, I saw Barenboim at Orchestra Hall. Mulcahy was with me, and we were walking in for a brass quintet uh, rehearsal using one of the halls. And as we're coming down uh, the, the uh, musician's entrance, stage entrance, stairs, we, we reach the red carpeting uh, of the basement. And to the right is an elevator. All of a sudden, it opens up, and there's Barenboim holding scores and in a hurry and walking quickly. And he has had an entourage of assistants, like probably six people all around. Mr. Barrymore, my school, all this. And he's not happy. And we both said, hi, Danny. He said, he knows my name. He said, hi, Mick, hi, Charlie. And, uh, but he didn't say it in a, you know, really, hi, so good to see you. No, he was, he had something going on in his head. And Mulcahy, he read it right away. He said, we're all walking, converging. And he said, oh, you just had finals for cello, didn't you? And you didn't pick anybody. He knew how he could sort of needle Baron Boy. He, he loved Baron Boy. But he, he sort of got in after exactly what had happened. Baron Boy didn't say yes. He said, you know, I only look for three things. Holy cow. That's what I wanted to hear. 
I want to know what conductors want to hear. Well, if I tell my students they're getting ready for an audition, don't play for other trumpet players. For heaven's sakes, that's the weakest person musically you ever want to play for. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, we learn a lot from trumpet players, don't get me wrong. And those that study with Jason and, and other people in here, they're helping you tremendously. But you should play for the oboe teacher and the viola teacher, the cellist, and certainly the orchestra director. Sign up a time and play for him or her. That's what you should be doing. So I, I, I right away took up my, my notepad, of course it was all mental, and wrote down the three things. He said, I only look for three things. Bear and Boyd, how about that? Play in tune, finish a phrase. The Spiegel, Pines of Rome, play that. So finish a phrase and say something. I don't have to agree. That's what he said. Pretty cool, huh? And they're all very important. And they didn't play in tune. They didn't finish a phrase. They cheated the ends of phrases. So. If you, if you make yourself really stretch these phrase, phrases and finish those notes and let them sing and set it up. I mean, if you play that in time, that first. That sounds terrible. Just because I came in time on the last note. It has to relax. So we go to the peaks faster, louder, and right at the end, then they relax. And if we do that in time, it's terrible. So I know I'm spending a lot of time on that, but peaks, um, there was a man that traveled around the United States, probably in, I'm going to guess, in the 70s. Your grandparents, I think, were born then. In the 1970s, and he spoke about peaks being the most essential element of music because it dictated our time not the metronome dictated our time influenced our tone influenced our intonation and said something <laughs> like Baron Boyd he did classes all over the United States <clears throat> I couldn't attend one but I had some friends when he, when he came through Chicago and he went to like three or four of them it was monumental how important that was okay Charlie A2 can it be Flexible. used to warm up on that every time before concerts he'd play straight through that he didn't do it down a note he played it in C on C and it was so romantic it moved you you wanted to be in tears how how much he used time as a tool of his expression okay I'm spending a lot of time on this sorry you're standing up there so long That's right. and, and I'm gonna say a lot of really good things about your playing <clears throat> But it, when you use time, it, it will affect your audience. And you have to make, make yourself do it more. You have to experiment. You have to get to the point where you, of course, you all tape yourself when you practice. Because the best ear, the, and the best teacher in the world is your ear. And of course, you have to train it to be suspicious of intonation, to be a better musician, do a lot of things. But it's your ear that will listen to the playback of your practicing and the way you play through a piece. You should get to the point where you play a piece like Pines of Rome and say, Fred, you overdid it that time with the time. Then you're going in the right direction. Don't be subtle. First time you play through Pines of Rome, put those X's on all the peaks and make sure you do it. You know, Respighi actually writes two of them in near the end. Di -da. He has a diminuendo, or maybe it's a crescendo to it. The second note in that phrase is the peak. And then it's a long time to the next one. Right? So I know that's it's my pet. I, I bring in that. I'm sorry. Don't kill me. Um, okay, so honey out the peaks. 
Second way of being more musical. It, it will change you. It'll be a, a, a renaissance in your play. I guarantee it. You have to experiment with it. And the last one, it's like Fairboy said. Tell a story. I'm going to tell you about three or four things in this grouping. Tell a story. What's it about? Is this thing about playing the trumpet? Is it a train wreck? Is it a ballad to maybe uh, your future daughter to get her to go to sleep? Is it Romeo singing to Juliet? Is it sad? Is it about, uh, I don't like you anymore, I want to kill you? You know, some operas do that, you know? What, what's it about? Think of a story of Charlie A2 or Charlie A6. Put it to words. That's really cool. And the last one, assign characters. Okay, so I told you about Brandt that has nothing in it. I'm going to tell you about the Haydn trumpet concerto and the Hummel trumpet concerto first movements. To me, it's a little bit like elevator music, dinner music. It's not threatening. It's not overly emotional. It's just simply nice, easy listening, right? Haydn first movement. Uh, not necessarily real challenging. Some, some, a few range of ba -ba 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 -ba, and a few things like that that are exciting. So when I say assign characters, I mean imagine that the first movement of these two pieces is a short story. Okay. So uh, in this short story, like an author would do, uh, he would start off and probably introduce characters. We'll say three. I found three in Haydn and Hummel. You can find more. You can uh, elaborate on those and maybe come up with some more. Um, and like I said, it's not threatening or it's not, you know, you think of the Hindemith first movement, and this thing's about death. Hindemith leaving his homeland. He's hearing the Nazis' tanks coming down the street. Da, 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 da. Now there, see, Mitcroft with, with strength. Bam, ba, da, ba, ba, ba. And then, then his, this soaring melody above that is his personality, needing freedom, needing, needing expression, needing to be able to have his friends. He was fired from the whole shula because he was playing in his trio with at least one Jewish guy. And they were fired too. And that's the strongest reason why he left his homeland. It was very painful to him. And he wrote these sonatas shortly after, you know, like early 40s, late 30s. And, um, and that is a serious piece. <laughs> the final chorale. All men must die. All men must mission sterben. All men must die. And and the last movement is a funeral march. Ba -ba -ba. Be -da -da -da. Ba -ba -ba. It's serious stuff. The Haydn and the Hummel are not that. So you could probably have eight characters in the Hindemith and really think of that, those as characters. In the Haydn, I have three characters. The most typical character that the trumpet player plays, the theme that we played for, and we've been playing it for two or three hundred years, are little fanfares, right? It's the military call. The opening of the Hummel. Ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba. That character I call Joe. Military, <laughs> G.I. Joe. So eventually he's going to introduce three characters and then tell a story about these three characters maybe going on a hike. They're not real close friends, but they decide to, to go on a little trail hike and, and it takes a bit, maybe uh, an hour and a half and it, it's sort of a story about what goes on. Joe is the guy that's going to reach down there and uh, chop up the snake that goes across the trail. Okay? He's in charge. He's telling everybody which direction we're going to go. He's the boss. And there's always somebody in, in, in every group, there's always somebody that's a take charge guy. Guess what? Those are trumpet players. <laughs> Usually. They don't have to be. But, but uh, that's G.I. Joe. And so if it's loud, if you can play a passage in the Haydn first movement, Hummel first movement, if you can play it loud, you think you should play it loud and tongue it, it's Joe. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Goyans wrote, did, out the, did the first arrangement of the Haydn when he found the parts in the 30s, 1930s, and he printed it at piano. He missed the boat. I know that's sort of a Mozart and Haydn-esque kind of thing to do, to play a light figure like that. Trumpet? No. <laughs> Trumpet. Bop, 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 bop. 
Get rid of those ideas. You, you'll change the way. Here's the problem with the Haydn and Hummel, is that no dudes recorded it during their, during their lifetimes, right? I mean, during Haydn's lifetime and Hummel. There were no recordings. We can do whatever we want. I'm giving you the tools, how to play the Haydn and trumpet, trumpet. Haydn and Hummel, trumpet concertos, first movement, your way for the first time instead of listening to seven recordings and making a composite. composite. I'm giving you the tools. One is look for peaks. Play what's on the page. Don't do that because it's going to be Dave Hickman, Voizan, Gatala, uh, Ross Medvig, somebody's arrangement. Don't do that. Why would you do that? Be yourself. Don't listen to recordings when you're going to do the Haydn. You'll be a clone. I never do that. Trust yourself. Even at your age and your level of, of uh, technique and musicianship, trust yourself. Of course it will change. Yo-Yo Ma, you know? He, he would learn a piece his first year out of Juilliard. He's got, he's got management. He learns a piece. He goes out and travels around for a couple of years with that piece. He puts it away and he's doing other pieces. Ten years later, you know what he does? He starts with a new, clean addition. He gets rid of those youthful ideas the way he learned it the first time. Because he's grown. His aunt died. His cats both died. You know, his mother got cancer. Changed his life. And so those pieces have different meaning. So um, he used different tools than just whatever he learned as a kid because his teacher taught him to do it that way. <laughs> Teachers should be a lot more imaginative. I don't want my students to play like I do. So I play things different ways. I did say that the Respighi is a classic. There's no doubt about it because all those peaks, I think that everybody in this room would probably agree with that are in that, in that piece. Okay, so we got G.I. Joe. If it's, uh, if you could slur it and put vibrato on it, it's a different character, isn't it? If that's the case, then why, why not slur it? Why tongue it? Because somebody wrote, ta, ta, da, ta, ta, da, ta. Somebody wrote that in and made an editing. That's not what Hummer wrote in there. Hummel uh, gave you the right to do what's on the page. And that's why he didn't write anything in. He wanted <laughs> to give you the ability, like Charlier with the dynamics at the beginning, to be your own self and be creative. Okay, so we got two characters. Um, and I, I call her Mary. If you can sing it, it's Mary. Mary sings all day long. She's whistling. She's like uh, Snow White. Whist you know, whistle while you work, and she's whistling all day. Music, that's all she hears. She is not confronting Joe. She just follows and having a good time. He just loves life. And that's what it is. So if it's, if it's soft and gentle, it's probably Mary. Okay, who's the third one? I call him Fritz. Fritz is sort of like the court jester. Uh, Jason's probably remembering this. I might have given you the same stuff. Joe, Fritz, and Mary. The classic Charlie Geyer, I'm sorry. Put any names you want, but go through your music, buy a new clean part to both those pieces, make three or four copies of the first movement, get rid of everything else you have, any little asterisks that Ed Tarr would write in there, this is the original, but this is what I like. Get rid of those things. I'm not saying all these people that have edited things aren't worthwhile, but uh, they're not the composer. There's somebody's interpretation. You can now be the interpreter. Uh, and then uh, use a magic marker. So I like royal blue for Joe. I just put it right above that passage up until it stops. And then I put in pink for Mary. I'm sorry. And, and I like a nice uh, uh, sort of light green, or you could use orange or yellow for Fritz. Fritz is the court jester. He stands in the back when the king is sitting there listening to disputes by all of his, all his peasants, one after another. And the court jester's staying back here in the, in the shadows. Big guy, you know, he's got a floppy hat and those weird shoes, and he's, got weird, he's wearing tights, you know. But he's supposed to humor the king. So he was a, he's a fun guy. That's what Fritz is. He makes a joke about stuff. So sure enough, right in the middle of these disputes, the front gates open up, and, and uh, three soldiers come running and say it. Your evil brother-in-law just came in, broke through the castle gates, and he's going to be here any, any minute. We're going to die. 
And Fritz steps forward. Well, let's invite them in for lunch. Thank you for chuckling, because that's exactly what Fritz does. He, so all the ornamentation, ba -da -da -dum, ba -da -da -dum, certainly isn't Mary, and it's not Joe. Any trills, da -de -a 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 -da 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 -de -da -da any, any of that kind of stuff, anything lighthearted. In the Haydn, I think the entire B section, uh, second time, uh, uh, the development section is Fritz. Ba -da 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 until Joe jumps in. I'll take it over from here. I'll get that snake, Fritz. Move over. And you don't want to pay. What a nice gesture. If you can play it loud, it's Fritz. It's Joe, right? There's a, you're going to find some spots where you don't know what to do. Yada. Ba, ba. You can play that as Joe and tongue it loud. Or you can sing it and have it merry. Your choice. Isn't that fun? Your choice. And that's what the music should be. Your choice and your way. Not all those recordings you've listened to. I have some favorites that I like and, and that, that I've listened to. I love the way Rolf Snedley played both those pieces. He had a certain lilt to his playing. It was just spectacular. I always wanted to do that. I played both of them many, 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 many times. And they're still living every time I play them. So that will help you tremendously to find these characters and, and, and try to do them. Now, why did I ask you to make three or four copies? Because a week later, you're going to change your mind. It's, it's hard to white out that big <laughs> blue mark. And that's good. That's what Yo-Yo Ma would do. He would change his mind and redo it, rethink it. So that's going to make you more musical. If you find some other ways to be more musical, it's not just putting vibrato on it, you know? Vibrato is just a tool, part of your tone. Tone is a tool, do you know that? It's, it's part of your expression. All these are tools, your technique are tools, all those things. So um, they're all tools for you to be expressive, like you do when you speak. How many people have been told, why don't you sing that first? Good point, huh? Yeah, sing it first. You're gonna break down your inhibitions and your insecurities of playing because you're not thinking about playing, playing. And all of a sudden you'll be a lot further along being more musical. Okay, Akur, I wanna tell you about some of the things. Really pretty sound, very delicate, very pure, really pretty, I really liked it. You started off very successfully. I, I loved it right off the bat. You got a little tight in your breathing, yeah. and you sort of freaked out. Oh my God, I'm playing for all these people, I forgot. <laughs> oh yeah, but I, I think I can play the trumpet, and you sort of adjust it, and you relax a little bit more. And the way, one of the ways you got tight was because those shoulders go up when you breathe. Blow out the air, don't take a breath, just blow out. Blow out, all the way down, nothing, okay? Let it come back in. Yeah, no reason to those things that go up, is it? Uh, a, a very obese man, sleeping on his back, what's moving, his shoulders? Belly. His belly is moving. Why is it? Diaphragmatic breathing is when when the diaphragm we when we blow out our air, the diaphragm pushes down. Well, actually, caves in. I guess I'm not sure. Arnold Jacobs was very helpful about this. Why does the stomach get bigger? Because the diaphragm's pushing some organs out of the way. There's no oxygen down there, but the, the oxygen is just filled in the lower part of your lungs. <clears throat> the safest way to breathe always is the same way we would want to breathe uh, to be able to blow up a balloon. Think about that. Those balloons, we got that balloon, it's about that long, it's narrow. We blow it up. What happens? The nipple never gets filled. And, and we're scared to keep blowing because it's going to blow up in our face. If we want to get the end, the bottom part of our lungs, mm -hmm. we start there. Mm -hmm. So, little nipple right there. And it'll fill up. If we want to get a capacity breath, you have to start down here. Try it sometime. Try this. But if you start here,
If you want to do that, I hardly ever do. Notice it even changes my sound of my voice when, when I have to lift up here and this is under compression. So the most natural free breath is the one, that big, huge guy on his back or woman sleeping. And so you got a little tight and you took some breaths when you didn't even need it. Right. And, um, you know, we all were taught, we've all been taught that, unfortunately, and there were a couple people that did this in my teacher, that the cure-all to almost everything is, is the use of your ear. Jacobs is one, and the student of his, Vince Jacobs. Boy, did they hit air. Now, they were right about one thing, and Vince told me once, one time, said, you know, the key to playing a brass instrument is a marriage. And this is true. It's a marriage between two things. What are they? Air, air, air and your embouchure. Right. And guess which one we were born with? Not the embouchure. <laughs> that air's been there all along. We get into trouble because we mess with it. Now, Jacobs was missing part of a lung, and he was a tuba player. How do you think he thought about air? <laughs> he should have stayed out of the trumpet business, though, because we have excessive air, and it gets in our way, and we start playing like that, and we close this off, and we're tight, and it affects our embouchure. It affects everything. So, you know... Did I take a break breath? I don't have to. Here's what I say. Take the amount of air you need. If you ever ask singers, you'll get 98% of them that will say exactly that. Ask them how much air they take in. They're gonna look at you like you're an alien. What kind of questions? What do you mean? Um, what? And why are we supposed to copy the voice? In almost everything. They take what they need. Why don't, why don't we? Because we've been indoctrinated to take a capacity of breath. How many feel they should take a capacity of breath? Be honest. That you've sort of been taught that all the time. Isn't it going to be stupid for a one note entrance of do? <laughs> 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 How about just do <laughs> this air all the no just for a second don't anybody breathe when I say so just blow out whatever's there inside isn't that amazing there's air sitting in there all the time and it's comfortable it's not under pressure it's always there it's like in a big bowl and you just tap the bottom of it you actually it's a diaphragm muscle that's pushing it out it's always there and I had so much trouble with Reynolds was it Reynolds or? yeah uh, it, starting like that because it's so unnatural to start without a breath. Okay, so I would try to relax you so you get a friend. Anybody in this room? Maybe, but they're trumpet players and it might disturb you to have them in the room. But if you've got a good friend that can come in and they're just going to sit there and uh, next to you and watch you. And every time you raise your shoulders, you're going to hit your foot with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and I guarantee you, within a, one or two days, it'll be either broken bones, <laughs> but you will learn to relax more. And then when you play, you'll also broadcast that relaxation to your audience so they can relax because it, you sound so beautiful, it sounds easy, and that's what you want to do. And then they're on your side. They're not involved in you technically, you know? Yeah. They just can hear your music because you have very beautiful uh, uh, production, and, and it's just, there was no reason, just because there's a rest doesn't mean we're supposed to breathe, but I was taught that. I was taught that in third grade. If there's a rest, that's where we breathe. You know where I got in trouble? Pa, 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 And my first teacher was a clarinet guy. He said, no, you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> you're gonna get so full, you're gonna pass out. So I, I, on my own, in third grade, I practiced not breathing, but just hearing that rest. Pop, 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 pop. Boy, I felt like I, it was the best thing I ever learned. I was third grade. I thought, wow, I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's, again, it's an old habit. You take a big breath, and every time you start getting a little tense, we think that the air, again, is a pacifier, that it calms us down. It, it's our enemy when you do that. 
So you want to think air, easy air. So I went through my music when I went when I started discovering this because I I um, rebelled against Chiglitz because he his, his was always big breath. And like I said, he actually had us play an A tune when we'd run out of that air. He'd, he'd let us stop rhythmically and just get another good breath. Well, that's nice to teach a good breath, but it's not, you can't do that musically. And then I realized that I never took capacity breaths except for those few pieces in the literature that sort of needed. And, and my solution to the ballerina, by the way, was, and to this day, and I'm not gonna do it, I can play through the ballerina in uh, one and a half times in one breath. One and a half times. I can certainly get all the way up to ba da ba da ba da ba the second time. You all want to hear me do that? Yes. Forget it! <laughs> <laughs> but for years, people, uh, there was a guy that conducted the band, I forget his name, maybe Best, at Interlochen. And I did a class in Missoula, Montana. The place was packed because it was El Vizzuti's home. And here I come into his home and do a master class at a, in a band room. And he's standing in the back, and at one point he raised his hand. Mr. Geyer, Mr. Geyer, he's probably 22. Mr. Geyer, I heard you can play the ballerina in one breath. I said, yes, I can. He said, do it. I'll never forget that. And I went on, kept doing. It's not the best solution. But that was my solution, because I, I didn't have a fast breath. So I decided the fast breath was better. Because in the heat of the battle, when the conductor's there, and, and you're here, and for some reason, we're just a little tighter. And under that situation, I wouldn't always get through it in one breath. So I developed another strategy, and that was the quick breath. And I teach it to my students. It's a very good choice. Okay, so you don't do that. You could go through here, and you could mark three things, and you would write here a, a little comma. Mm -hmm or an S for small breath. So that's what you're gonna do right now. Okay. You're gonna play up to there, and you're going to take a breath here, and a breath there. But they're gonna be tiny, they're gonna be like this. Just enough air to play two measures. Okay. Just listen. Yeah. Uh, quite much. for fun of it. But I, I had way too much air. I could have played all the way through. Here we go. Yeah. Little air. And another one here. slow it down to. All right, so wasn't that different? Yeah. It was different, and, yeah. and you won't get tight. I had to write it in, and for two years, every piece I played, I wrote in what kind of a breath. It was astounding how few times I had to put a Barbara Butler there. <laughs> BB. I knew Barbara, so I was, you know, Barbara Butler. And you see that in music, right? BB, right there. The big breath is not Barbara Butler. <laughs> And very few times. So try to make your breathing more natural, like singers do. All right, so you need to do that. Okay. All right, you don't like, well, let me. Uh, Tell where you stopped. How many times is Forte printed? Bet you don't know. I think once. Told you, but you didn't know. <laughs> I see three times. Three. Wow, look at that. Yeah. You should take every piece you ever learned, put the horn away, and look at what the dynamic scheme is in the piece. We tend to do dynamics on the fly, which means we really don't do them. <laughs> look 
what the scheme is. Dolce for the first eight bars, whatever you want. I personally think our best, the most ease we have in playing, and our best sound is mezzo forte to forte. Maybe not even up to forte. It's in the middle range, mezzo piano to mezzo, something like that. It certainly is in pianissimo or fortissimo. Right? And so I want to be relaxed. This should be your best sound, and that's what you started with, and it was gorgeous. But you've got to make this crescendo so that's effective. That's the only rule you have to do. So if we keep going here, a little swell, espressivo. You're already espressivo, but he's asking you to do it maybe with time. I don't make a big one here. Okay. I just a little bit of a pause. Sometimes nothing. He's interrupting it on purpose. Right. It's like a game. Mm -hmm. It's like when we talk, we stop for effect. Um, saying, the thing I like about your sound is, didn't have to wait that long, right? You wanted the answer. Okay, so forte. You don't like that trill. No, I don't. Yeah, I mean, give me your horn. So, what's the worst trill on the trumpet? George, what trill do you hate? Um, There's different answers here. There's not one answer. One, three, and two. One and three. Oh, I'm going to. I'm going to. Yeah, that's a long one. <laughs> Fortunately, we don't have to do that very much, do we? We really don't. But uh, there's this one. And I had to learn sort of a, tr a, tr uh, a strategy here. I, I do this with this, and then I make these flat. And I was able to get that one. But there's a few others, and it's not about the fingering. C to D in yes. the staff, right? How many people hate that one? Wasn't that a revelation? Yeah. Like, and so your teacher, you're playing something that comes from the... Uh, you're doing that, you know, in the lesson, and the teacher says, yeah, let me hear you trill from B flat to C. And you go... That's hard. So I, you know, because it was hard, man, I spent a lot of time on it. What, what's the problem there? I'll just tell you quickly. It's because you're passing over a partial. Even G to A bada, is difficult the same way. That's what's going on here. You're passing over a partial. So you're such a good player. Don't let that be a shortcoming. Tomorrow, be OCD. How many of you are OCD? Yeah. And you know what? That's why you're good. All the good players are OCD. You have to be. Pushy, pushy, pushy. It's awkward, very doubt, no doubt. But you want to make it musical. It doesn't have to be the fastest trill in the world. Right. But you got to slow it down. And what it ends up being, it being is almost like a lip trill, and, and it coincides with the finger. And we just have to practice. There's so many techniques. I think there's 83. I made that up. <laughs> um, so what are we going to do here? It suggests staccato with a slur. Right. And that's a very interesting thing. It can mean three or four different things. It could mean that this is a phrase, and it should be staccato. Or it can mean a type of staccato, leggero, blah, 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 blah. still separate, but almost okay. slur-like. Yeah. It can be a lot of things. Poco, poco, stringendo, and then he says over here, senza. And of course, you know what all those things mean, right? Yeah. So everybody's pulls back there. Same old trill. But he says, ad libitum. Pa, 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 so you only have to do a few and it could be really slow. And you do that one fast, because you can. That could be construed as being forte, couldn't it? So there could be four of them in here. Mm -hmm. And if, by having that knowledge about it, it can help you sort of figure out how to do this. Please do not listen to somebody play these mm -hmm. okay. recording, for heaven's sakes. So um, the main thing was I felt that it got a little tight, so your playing changed. Yeah. You got self-conscious. Who doesn't? We, we all do. We start realizing, oh my god, there's people here. Jay Friedman, first trouble in the Chicago Symphony, we're getting ready to play a concert at East Lansing, Michigan. I was sitting next to him. And he's warming up. I said, wow, Jay, look, there's hardly anybody here. And he didn't respond. 
And then about 20 minutes later, I said, wow, look at all the people here. Charlie, don't tell me about the people. I don't know they're there. If he really used that, he was a master at it because he was, a lot of people said he was a very cold player, wasn't connected with anybody. No, he wasn't cold. He was probably, he still is, probably the best sackbutt player you'll ever hear on the trombone. He's so accurate, such a light player. But isn't that interesting? He, just, he, he said he wouldn't look. He wouldn't look out there. Okay, you're finished. Thank well, you very thank much. You. Bravo. Somebody else had their hands up, right back there. You actually were ahead of Okura, but <laughs> Okura. Yeah. And then you're next. Ohio State, you're next. <coughs> Ohio State, I'm a Northwestern guy. How are the Cubs doing? They're playing uh, Cincinnati right now. <laughs> Who cares, huh? Okay, and you're gonna announce what you think? Do you need to play another two? Probably a few. So you just proved you didn't need to play in order to. What do you think we all do best in life? Washing dishes, brushing our teeth, riding a bike, playing the trumpet. You've, you've made more demands on your trumpet and you want to do it at a very high expertise level. I guarantee you, you play the trumpet better than you do anything else. Trust yourself. You can play that. Now, if, if you start playing some arpeggios, and you got yourself up to some high C's and some low notes, then I would say, that was, that's a good warm up, because you're warming up. If yeah. I'm going to know I'm going to play Mahler 5, my warm up's going to stare up with you. Da, 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 dun, da, 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 da. Make sure I can get that first <laughs> you know, and Probably a low A flat, and certainly a high loud A. So you're ready to go, okay. sounds like. I would trust yourself. Okay. Make the announcement. Right. What? Uh, I'm, hi, I'm Corey Hermans, and I will be performing. Don't have to look at it. If you look at it, it like it's like, uh, hi, hi, I'm Corey, and I'm going to play the hide. Looks like you didn't know what you were going to play. <laughs> so you know, get away from the music stand. And you did the right thing. You got rid of the trumpet. Bravo. So you remembered that. Get it again. And speak loudly so that everybody out there can hear you. Hi, I'm Corey Arends, and I will be for, uh, performing an excerpt of Honiger and Trotta. Now, do you think anybody recognized your name because it went by so fast? I'm Corey Gosh for Back a Bunch. All right. <laughs> That's the one thing we want to know. You know, it could have been Smith and it could have been Rick and Josh. I couldn't tell. So one more time. Sorry, we spent a lot of time because we our students become really, really good players. And they can't speak at all. You know, that, that can't happen. So the the class that I hated the most in high school, my sophomore year, out of four years in high school was speech class. I hated that class and I was terrible. They gave us three ways to do, to, to do a speech. One was memorize. Second one, make an outline and, and use that to glance at. And then extemporaneous speaking. Uh, I couldn't do the outline. I spent more time trying to remember what I wrote and what it had to do with anything. <laughs> and memorizing, I was so self-conscious, forget that. Extemporaneously, I stumbled all over the place until the last week. They let, me, they let us all do whatever we wanted to do. Any topic. <laughs> <laughs> I walked up and I took my cornet apart, put it on the little table right there. And they're all looking at me and, and, uh, and I was all ready to go because I knew how the cornet worked. I knew I had to buzz my lips into this more comfortable little mouthpiece that, that sort of fit on the lips. And, and I, I knew what happened when I push a, a valve down, that it, went, it traveled through this and lowered the valve, lowered the, uh, the, the range. And I explained all that, and I might have taken 12, 15 minutes. And I went through all that, lickety split, everything. I was the last one in the room, and, and I was just putting everything back together, and the class was dismissed, and the teacher is walking toward me, big smile on her face. She said, see? All you have to do is know what you're talking about. So you can stand up here and do this. I mean, I, how many times today did I forget even what I was talking about? Don't worry about it. Somebody will help you. <laughs> <laughs> just, just the thing you know better than anything else is your name. I didn't hear permits. Yes. Yeah, I didn't hear that at all. <laughs> so speak carefully so that they in the back can hear you. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Corey Hermans, and I will be performing an excerpt of Honiger and Trotta. so you can um, be more successful and also cover up areas where you didn't think it was so, so good and the audience did. Our biggest goal when we perform is to fool the audience. It's like acting. It's an illusion. So looking comfortable like I, I dealt with uh, her about uh, and, and the way you breathe and how you speak and how you stand uh, helps you um, to broadcast it. Anybody ever see Doc Schuster play Timothy Doc Schuster? I saw him play three times. And um, the Eastman Brass Quartet went to Finland, Lieksa, uh, Finland. It's way up north. It's like eight miles from the Russian border. And um, Stephen Burns was there. He just got married. Eastman Brass, Barbara and myself. Uh, uh, Roger, um, Tuba player from LA, can't think of the name all of a sudden. Famous tuba player was there, and Doc Schutzer and his wife. And we had breakfast all together every morning. Every morning. And uh, but here's the way Doc Schutzer would perform. I'm backstage. You can't see me. Before he played a note, you knew it was going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. And, and you got up here and could barely hear you. And you couldn't say your name clearly enough. And it's like, and I'm, I'm going to play, uh, oh yeah, Oniger. I mean, uh, you're already, so you could practice having that character. You don't have to look quite like that. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, you sort of have an idea of what you want to do with this. It's an entrada, and there's a lot of just held chords. So, it's been understood that we can be fairly rubato. And you're playing it, you know, like many of the. So, what's the problem with, the, with uh, Doc Schitzer's piece that he played so much, the Aratunian? What's the problem? Everybody's playing it like Aratunian did. I, I hear 24th generations down. Ba, 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 ya, ba, 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 ba. And then everybody does it the same way the second time. Don't ever do that. Only ministers do that. God is good. God is good. No. God is good. God is good. Come on, be more emphatic. You know. So, yeah. Um, I don't know what that had to do with anything, but. <laughs> so um, the rubato is fine, but I wouldn't. Again, I would try to divorce yourself from the way you've heard things. I didn't like how disconnected these were. They were separate notes. Ba 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 ba. 
So for starters, I'm going to take the difficulty of this piece away for a second. The difficulty of this piece is um, he, uh, all the way up to uh, where we, you stop right, right here. Uh, you've got a, two octaves in the fourth in range. That's tough. And uh, Phil Smith said the biggest mistake he ever made in having auditions for his orchestra was when he put this on the required first piece. Instead of the Heidner album, he put the Entrado on there. That cut people out. People that he knew about in New York, he was anxious to give them a shot at it. It was for, uh, he was, it was the first audition he had. It was placing, replacing uh, Johnny, uh, Johnny, whatever it is. Uh, where? Where? Johnny Ware. Thank you. And uh, so it wouldn't be co-principal anymore because Phil came in as co-principal. It would be third and associate principal, uh, something like that. And so he put this on here and just cut people out. So there are technical difficulties with this chord that you need to work on. So but we're going to start right here. And I want you to play long. <laughs> This piece is a solo, not a, a march or a, a brand A2. It's orchestral. So just play that much, could you please? One more time. Good, good. Okay, so that's easy because it's in the middle register. And now what we're going to do is we're going to play the first measure the same way. Okay. We're going back. We're going to go backwards. La ba 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 ba. Slowly, so you can read it all and have the same concept all the way down. Now start from the beginning. Same speed. What changed? Do it again, and then and just take a little breath, a little breath, and and start from the beginning. Start second measure. better and again starting on that low note can be tough it can be tough but it, we do better when we address the things that we think are hard and then we find a way a strategy to make it easier and I, I came up with this one where I like already been playing so it's much easier so, so I'm, I'm gonna make myself get that first note for sure okay so you were a little choppy like that and then the high notes became a difficulty. And I, you know, welcome to the club. All these guys that were phenomenal players that uh, Phil Smith was using, playing actually with the orchestra all during that time. He said, I can hardly wait. And they just folded on this piece. He said it was the biggest mistake he ever made. Because for them to step in and do that. So, of course, the world decided to use that. So what does Barbara and Charlie do for a required master's degree? The Entrada. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but the levels changed, and everybody knows they have to be able to play this, and everybody is really rising to the occasion to be able to jump in and play this piece, and we have to find out who's the best of the best. So we challenge them, um, and, and there's certain things we ask for. We always ask for this for the undergrads. We ask for the Nesco legend, and they play everything except the last two lines that are muted. We've been asking that forever because there's almost everything in there. Starts with soft, you know, sort of slow, and then triple tummy. Then there's a high C in there for high school students, seniors. That's a toughie. It can be a toughie, but we want to find out where they are. So um, you can spend time with these intervals. Mm -hmm. There's ways to do it, OK? So could you start here? That much, that's all. Just easy. to the, just to the A flat. A flat, yeah. Just easy and don't play into the stand. You're doing a little bit. Just, yeah. Easy, not too fast. Half, half that air. Half of it. No, half the amount of air. Okay. You, you've got enough air to play that five times. I promise. Top it down. <laughs> You're making me a bad teacher. <laughs> So that's good. So 
we're, we're sort of counting you know, your, your pluses. And so that's very good. Now can you play that note? Lights up. Over. You, you got it. Mm -hmm. Good. Now let me hear this one. Just by itself. What, what do you make that face for? <laughs> Who wants to come in on a high beat? I'm going to guarantee it's easier than playing it with G sharp before it. Yeah, probably is. Yeah, you can play the high beat. You can play that. You, you bet. So how do we play it? Isn't it disgusting? You want to hit them, right? <laughs> then why you can do that? Okay. Uh, why can he do that? Okay. How do we how do we find a note? We hear it, right? How many? Raise your hands. You guys are so uninformed. Wait. How many people in this room have perfect pitch? You can't hear it. That's a wasted effort. You're doing it because somebody told you to do that. But you don't really hear it. You don't hear it at all. What are you really doing? Remembering. Feeling it. Feeling it. Yeah, it's the sixth sense. Uh, it's kinetic sense. It's the ability to ride a bicycle and have the balance. Float in a pool. Play a high note or any note on the trumpet or a horn. And that's good news. Because trying to hear it, you're going to get 80 years old and you're still not hearing that baby. <laughs> <laughs> but you can feel it better and better all the time. I, her said had incredible accuracy. When I was young, I had the same kind of accuracy. I just didn't miss. I didn't miss. I played the entire... 19 years old, the entire first opera season with rehearsals, I don't remember missing a note. The next year I played Wozzeck, 20 years old. I didn't miss notes. Why was that? God love me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but it didn't help anything. Okay, so we feel it. And that's good. You just proved it. You just proved it. And I, I didn't want you to be fearful. I'm going to have you play three separate notes here. This one, this one, and this. We'll start this one, just like you played it. Pa 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 pa. Lots of space, no breath in between. Okay. Small breath all total. Smaller anyway. Don't be afraid of it. You can articulate it. You sound beautiful up there. And, and you sort of freaked out and you couldn't demonstrate to everybody how great you are, because you are very good with that kind of stuff. But we have to think sometimes individual notes rather than, we don't want anybody to hear us play those three individual notes out of time or even as separate. We, they want keep like they're all connected. But I'm thinking three notes. Okay. Where they are, how I play them, everything. Now, Kira, you did something that you did also here, and I forgot to talk about it. And it's, it's an ill that we have as trumpet players, and that is we are terrible at downward slurs. And you had a couple downward slurs that didn't speak right in the middle of where you were playing beautifully. They just didn't speak. Lower notes, lower notes take more air, less air, the same amount of air. Ready? Same amount of air. More air? Yeah. Not less, that hand up. L lower nate notes, why? The embouchure's open, and, and uh, we, we need to fill it up. And, if we, and what projects more, high or low? Uh, high. So we can play the low notes louder. Beep, ba, beep. And, and, but it wasn't there, it was somewhere else. You, you, we didn't play any of this. No. But you had some note in a silly place, and it was a downward one that it just didn't speak. Keep your air going through it. Might have been a, something like that where there was a, an interval. So this piece, you could, you could really benefit by playing this slowly every time there's an interval over a fourth. Every time. Charlie A2, you get in the middle of a section, all those low notes, mm -hmm. and they're all slurs down. D ya, be da 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 ya, ba da da di ya. And boy, do we hear people struggle with that when they audition for us. Because both the undergrads, for Barbara and Charlie, and the grads, and the doctoral students, and everybody has to play Charlie A2. It's one of the greatest pieces ever written. And that middle section is tough, those downward slurs. So again, if you address that, and every day add that to your prowess practicing, things that you want to get better about technically, 
So let me see if I have anything more to say. Um, be ba 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 da da di da da di da da da. Change your your articulation. Okay. You're up there on a high C. It can be sort of bold and, and really brilliant. This could be a little more articulate, maybe. And then uh, adjusted during the diminuendo in the two and a half octave range. Uh, so that would be nice. So all your problems had to do with just not being as comfortable and confident about some of the intervals. And it wasn't just the highs, but getting back down to the mm -hmm. lows. So you got to address those and become so proficient that everybody thinks you're fantastic at it. And nobody would ever know. Because you have a very nice sound. And when you played broader here, it was exactly right instead of so punchy. So I think of that, ba ba be ba ba, and I think you're a little overboard in the rubato, okay. just a little bit. Uh, but certainly, I like to hear it freely, um, and having where you want to, um, where you want to sort of make peaks. So, in general, up until where you stopped, where can you breathe? In general, where should you never breathe? You ever think of this? What beats should you not breathe after? Um, I would probably have to beat one. No. Nope. Wrong. Okay, I don't know. Since the piece starts with pickups. Ba, 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 ba. That's a phrase, isn't it? It goes all the way to one. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where you should breathe okay. if you would breathe. Where would you breathe here? Look at this. This phrase starts on two. Ba, ba, ya, ba, ba. Places you can breathe would be after one, after three. Never after four. Don't breathe there. Di ba da ja ba. That eight is connected to that note. It's not di ba di ba ya ta ta. The phrasing from there to there is all about pickups. Christmas oratorio, the final movement. Bum ba 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 bum bum bum. Bach was a rhythmic genius. This tune is all about pickups. Ba ya ba 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 bum 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 bum. The whole piece is about pickups. And when you think of it that way, the pickup goes to one. That's, that's the, the peak. And, and this is what the line is. Where's your first, first peak? The first peak? Mm -hmm. the B. Right Thank you. The first B flat, second measure. But it's a, it's a minor peak. Mm -hmm. And then the major one is the F. The F. Ya, pa, 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 pa. We should play it that way like I made it, God. <laughs> Thank you for the talent you gave me, but I worked hard and I made it. My first statement is bold and it sounds trumpety and it's just perfect. But then the next one, di, da, ja, pa, 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 pa. Those are pickups and they're attached to that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you could do more of that. Um, now I'm going to show you something. The soft section, which you did not play, um, I'm just going to sing it. We normally play da da di da 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 da. We always go to the high note, but in this case, the high note is on a weak beat. It's on B two, B two, da da da. So I have a little trick. I start mezzo piano, and I actually make a diminuendo to the weak beat. Da da di da 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 ya da da. I make the first beat. Ya da ya da da. So I'm making the high note softer. What do you think the audience thinks? They think I'm playing the whole thing softly. It's an illusion. I'm very secure because I'm starting mezzo piano. But when I play that note, which I can sing on because it's a little longer and puts some vibrato, mm -hmm. I play it softer. And so they actually think I'm playing the whole thing softly. Da di da 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 ya da 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 di di da da all the way through there. Da 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 da. So in this case, the first beat is still ever presently important, mm -hmm. and and then you could end up playing uh, this whole thing and sounding softer and never being that insecure. Oh, well, it's a, you know, broadcasting. Okay, um, that's it. You need to work on those intervals so they're really ba be ba be ba every one of them. Just stand some sit down, and I, I guarantee it. You know, I'm going to tell you something. 
There's an amazing, amazing fact I want to tell you. When I was a kid, I didn't believe in it because I hated to practice. So I, I became a really good sight reader because I didn't like to practice. So I didn't have to. I, I, I really became an amazing, I, I think I told you, I told somebody, but I switched to a C trumpet. Did I talk about that? Yeah. Sophomore year. And I right away, I could transpose. Well, I was transposing in second grade because my sister played accordion. So we played beer barrel poker, Lady of Spain. And I had to learn all those things, transposing up a note with my B flat cornet. So transposing down a note was almost the same thing. You know, B flats were C's. Now the C's are B flats, F's and E flats, and all this stuff. I sort of, sort of learned it. So I became a very good sight reader. But I found something out when I came to Northwestern. Chigwitz was uh, very structured, and he gave a routine that everybody did. And I found out that when I did that routine, and this is the gift, this is a gift from God. I truly, truly believe this. Okay? There's no doubt in my mind that God gives us all talents. That's even in the Bible. There's, there's a, you know, some stories about the master going to leave, and he calls in his three servants, and, and he gives them a dole of talent, which was a money. But you can think of it as talent. God gives us talents. We have different talents. I'm really good at doing dishes. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, and then, but God expects us to work and invest. And that's what those parables were that Jesus told. There were parables about investing the talent. So he came back and he asked each one, brought the first one in. Okay, so how are you? How are you doing? I've been gone a fortnight, whatever that is. And uh, so what'd you do with the talents I gave you? Oh, master, I invested my talents. I now have 20 talents instead of the 10 that you gave me. And he said, you are a wise steward. I will increase that 40-fold. And the details are a little bit different because they're also different in the various books. And so the next one comes in. He was given three talents for a measure of talent. He invested his. And, and, uh, and the master, God, repaid him. For, he, he gave him a, a, a big return on his investment. The last dude comes in and he said, so what'd you do with your one, your one talent? And he said, well, master, I was afraid I was going to lose it, so I buried it. God, the master, was not pleased. He said, you're a fool. Leave my sight. You did not invest. This is a good story to tell your students someday about when they come in and they're in your freshman class, and you love them, and they had amazing, just bumbling talent. And they're having fun being away from their family, being in college. Their roommates are cool, you know. They're experimenting with a lot of stuff, and they're just not practicing. It's the saddest thing in my life to see that happen, and it happens all the time. So, of course, I tell that story. So, but here's, here's God's gift. I'll just say it simply. If we do anything three minimum days in a row. Clark 30, 36, slowly. I'm going to guarantee you, whatever it is that you do three days in a row, it's going to improve. That didn't have to be, you know, but that is a phenomenon that is there. That's why it should be encouraging to you to practice. And don't, don't just haphazardly pick your horn out and just play whatever. Have a list of the techniques that you're working on. Big intervals. You got those high notes and they're beautiful. But getting to them is a little bit of, mm -hmm. yeah. So you need to become, you have to own that. You're a specialist. That one right there. Ba, ba. And yes, you can pick that out. You proved it every time. And, and these too. You got all the wherewithal uh, to, to, you know, to play all this too. So those are big skips. And it's one of the challenging things. But if you want to play this piece, you find out the most challenging sections, and that's what you work on. It's only what you work on. I'm doing the other stuff. But make a list. I said as a joke that there's 83 techniques in the world. There's a lot more than that. And uh, we should all have a seat. Thank you. Thank you. We should all, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> He's good. So is Akura. Really good, very talented, and you've put some work into it, so keep it up. And don't ever call me and tell me that you decided to not do it anymore. I'll hunt you down. <laughs> um, so I was gonna just say something that was really good, and that's why I had you sit down.
Um, okay, so you're going to make an assessment individually of your plan. Don't wait for your teacher to do that, you know? I tell all my new students that if they don't make it, it's not my fault. Not my fault. And if they do make it, it's not because of me. This is on your shoulders, even as a 17-year-old new freshman comes in. This is, you've been chosen because of the talent you have and a lot of things that you've developed, but this whole project that you want to do, this path, this adventure of pursuing music, and of course, none of you did choose the trumpet because you're a poet on, you know, in music, did you? No. How many of you listen to string quartets regularly? Would you say this is a couple odd men, odd people? It's unusual. Trumpet players just don't do that. Congratulations. We're trumpet players. Come on, we're jocks, you know. <laughs> we listen to an orchestra. What do we hear? If there's no trumpet in it, you know, I could probably uh, sing a bunch of themes. You wouldn't know them because there's no trumpet in the piece. And I was the same way. I took Barbara my first date. I got two tickets to the Vienna Philharmonic. They played the program down. We're sitting in orchestra hall. And, and here I'm in the Scarlet Symphony, and Barbara's an extra occasionally. And she's beautiful. And, uh, you know, I didn't know if anything would come of this, uh, me pursuing her. But at any rate, they play an encore. And they're going through the whole encore and whispering to her. So I know that song. I think I, I have no idea what it is. It sounds like this would be Mozart or you know, I don't know, Beethoven or Schumann. Da 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 both of us are bewildered, we have no idea. Until all of a sudden, digga 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 da pa 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 bum bum pa stage trumpet. <laughs> One of the most embarrassing times in my life. There went the bubble. The Charlie Geyer from the Chicago Symphony. She's not gonna date me again. Doesn't even know how the rest of the piece goes. It was embarrassing. We we both went. <laughs> And that's the way we are, okay? That's the way we are. We just, we, we, we chose the trumpet for other really strange reasons. And you should maybe think, spend a little time sometime. It's shiny. <laughs> <laughs> it's small. We don't have to carry a tuba. We don't, not going to do that. You know, it's easy to carry around. We get to play the melody. That's cool. It helps us, we, we get the girls. Sorry, for the girls in the room. You get the guys, whatever. <laughs> but it, the trumpet, it's God's gift to the music world. You know, whatever. It, it's just, it's great. And maybe our dad played the trumpet or wanted to play the trumpet. Or we heard Harry James play a, you know, uh, in a movie once and uh, Al Hurt or whatever. But well, we, we certainly do it, didn't do it because we're poets. I hate to tell you that. You're going to have to learn to be a musician. You have to learn it. And while you're doing it, you're going to have to learn the technique, too. And there's a lot of techniques. So the next time you have some free time, don't put music on. Grab a pad of paper with a lot of pages, because you're going to write a lot. <laughs> and you start writing down probably the, the thing you hate the most and the thing you can't do. So maybe the first thing on the list is a double high X. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Probably somewhere on your, the list of your top 10, there's going to be high notes. Why? Because we're nothing if we can't play high notes. Isn't that a shame? If you're a singer and you can't get the high notes and you're a woman, you can always be an alto. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Not in the trumpet. Ever hear the alto trumpet? <laughs> Trombone. Can't get those high notes? There's bass trombone. <laughs> I can have a career. <laughs> Not in the trumpet. So of course that's going to be on your list. And it should be a priority. Of maybe the, one of the major things you do every day is, is going in the direction. And I could give you plans on how to develop range. It's not one of those things, a double C in three weeks. It's not one of those. It's, it's very healthy. I can give you a plan for every technical thing you need to work on. But on that list, you better have, first of all, smooth legato playing. Smooth, not notes that don't speak. Every note speaking. You start easy, middle register. Da 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 da. Perfectly. And be obsessive about it. Get it really. What does the word fundamentals mean? You know, everybody says you got to do fundamentals. 
You know what that really means? You have to do exercises that are basically simple but demanding and fundamentally do them correctly. That's what it means. There is no book of just fundamentals. Your imagination can, this is, I'm giving you them. Range, which means low and high, being able to tongue, play in all dynamics, approach them right on the, on the button, approach them by octaves, first, of course, fourths. That, that, that's just a few things. Uh, you've got some extreme things you can put on there, lip trills, lip slurs. Flutter tonguing, flutter tonguing is a great asset. Multiple tonguing. Articulation in general should sound like your slur. It shouldn't be ta 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 ta. Something wrong. So slur first and use that as your model, and try to make it the same. Be in charge of your destiny. Make this list out of all the things and be specific, but don't write a letter about each one. You can just simply say articulation in all ranges. Now you can break that down later. And if you decide my middle register, I think I got that now. It's good. And I can do a do attack and a lu attack and I can do a two attack and I can do all those things. So. That's how gooey you could learn. That's just an extreme. And should, when you're sitting in the back of the orchestra, you've got to be like a machine gun with your articulation so it's very clear. So you get the whole expanse of your articulation. Uh, multiple tonguing. You should have a, a, a speed that you can do your single tongue in 16th notes. And every day, make sure you've got that. And then keep trying to push it. And what else do you want? You want to be able to multiple tongue longer phrases, not just three beats. Really isolate in your brain the things you want to get better at. What's really great is when you're in the class and you have a studio, there's always going to be other people in that room that can do something you can't do. You know, the first time you hear that during your freshman year or whatever year, you hear them do that, you know what you're doing? You've got that pad of paper and you're writing that down. Pete's articulation. It's all you need. That's what's great about being in a good school. You learn from the others. I'll tell you, our students learn from their peers more than they learn from Barbara and Charlie. Seriously. Every time when somebody says, they've had such success. All right, we got lucky. I'm going to tell you briefly. We got lucky. We started teaching together at Eastman School of Music. We didn't have to recruit. There were already good players there. Al Bazzuti went to school there. He stopped four years before. Barbara and Al Bazzuti we're, we're at interlock together. It's great pictures of them with their knickers. <laughs> they sat next to each other. Al Bazzuti was there. George Vosberg was there just before we came there. Um, uh, the guy that's associate principal in St. Louis. Um, uh, I can't think of his name. That's, that's where he went. So the school already had good players. We didn't have to do anything. We were young when we, when we started there. Um, in fact, I was 35 and Barbara was... She was 27. We were full professors. Based on our what we had accomplished. I'd been in Chicago Symphony, first in Houston Symphony, Grand Park, Lake Opera. Barb was principal in Grand Park. She replaced me. She was co-principal in Vancouver. And we were a team. They could start the East McGrath again because they had two faculty instead of a student. Um, uh, Tom Drake is the guy I was thinking of uh, who plays in St. Louis. Uh, went to Eastman. So they, it was already there. We were lucky. We didn't have to recruit. But we were active players. And so people heard us playing, found out we were teaching at, at Eastman, and they, uh, they started coming there. And I, I often say as a joke, if, if you want to be famous, wear a clean shirt every day and just keep getting older. Everything else takes place. It just happens, you know. Just, you're around forever. Uh, there's no magic in how I teach. You, you heard me say a bunch of stuff. You all could have said it. In fact, many of you in the room wondered why I didn't speak about his da da la da la But instead, I chose this. I, I, that's the way it was. There's no magic to it. 
If you want to be a great teacher, and there are great teachers, there's about four things you have to do. One, you must care for that student with all your heart, and you'll show it. You must care for them. Don't make stuff up. Don't try new gimmicks, like Zen meditation, for God's sake. Uh oh, I hit a chord. How many people do Zen meditation in here? Uh, <laughs> got really quiet. Um, okay, that could be helpful, you know, but I'm not going to teach it. I'm not going to teach it. Charlie Schluter got into a lot of weird stuff when he was having trouble in Boston and New England Conservative. He should have been teaching what, how he learned because he was a great trumpet player. He learned a lot of stuff. That's what you teach. You teach how you learn and you're honest. Those three things, they'll do it. If you don't have the answer about something, send them down the hall to Gail Williams or somebody, you know, somebody that might be able to uh, lend a hand to Bonham. Okay, so you make this list, and then you're going to put it in an order, the one you want the most, and the next one, all the way down. So the first 22 things are, the, are weak areas in your play. And then the other ones uh, are still listed all the way up to 183, beginning on a low F. Why isn't that on your list? Because you don't think it's important. Someday you're going to get caught having to come in on a low F softly. And who was it that played that? You. Played that low G every time. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, boy, what a talent when you get somebody that's got good low register. So Chris Martin, anybody here ever hear of Chris Martin? No. Okay. Chris Martin uh, stayed with me for four years at Eastman. I also had his, bro his brother, Mike, for four years at Northwestern. Chris Martin, when he was a junior, he advanced in, a, in an audition for the New York Philharmonic. At that point in his life, he was halfway through his junior year, he would have cut an arm off to play with Phil Snow. It was for fourth trumpet. And he advanced. He advanced. He was so excited. And guess what he practiced? The same old stuff. Ballerina, Promenade, Mahler 5, uh, Brahms 2, uh, you name it. Guess what was on the audition? Phil called me on the phone. Well, you know, it's fourth trumpet. They, they should, the person that wins the job's got to be able to play low notes better than I do. And Phil Smith was great low notes. Great, great, incredible. And, and so Chris wasn't prepared. He bombed on everything that was low. Everything. And he was, you know, guess what? It changed his plane. <laughs> and, and that's what happens. We, we start thinking about, don't let anything pass you by. Any technical thing. And you find them out by listening to other players in your studio classes and your teacher. You find out things that you can't do. Don't wait for your teacher to fill out that list of 187 things. So how many know of, of, of at least one book in all the literature for trumpet? It's called Daily Development and Maintenance of Technique. God, there's 30 of them on the market all the time. Everybody's written their book. There's a Mike Sachs book, Barbara wrote a book. It's their book. You can gain some stuff by looking at it. Make up your own book, and it's going to change all the time. That's the only problem I have with those other people that have wrote those book, written those books out. It's their routine. This is going to be your first routine every day after a brief warm-up. Here's the definition of Charlie Geyer's warm-up. Ready? Writing this down? As fast as possible. So I may not follow what your teachers have taught you. Remember, this is not practicing. This is not fundamentals. This is not your, your routine. It's your warm-up. Don't <clears throat> get hung up about it. As fast as possible, to be totally prepared to do what you need to do next without hurting yourself. Those three points, you can do them in any order. Without hurting yourself, go quickly and make sure you're prepared to do whatever you're going to do. If you're going to blend right into a daily routine and you're going to do legato passages, like five note slurred scales, and you're going to make sure they're perfect. Arnold Jacobs had a cool thing in his studio. He had a, a series of lights along the wall, and they were all different colors. 
and they were set up to decibels. So if you played Lights would be jumping like man. Oh, wait, whoever played that? Who played that? Yeah. So uh, I mean, he'd nail you. He said, "Can't you see that? Look, that's not the same. That's not the same volume. Why are you doing that?" And everybody's high notes would always be louder. They weren't even. I don't like this. That's somebody trying to be real musical, overly musical. You don't need to do that. Um, What's happening here is the ballerina has been gotten bugged by Petrushka, who loves her. I mean, who wouldn't? She's wearing a tutu. <laughs> she's in good shape. And she's agile. When she came out of the box, the three puppets, the Moor and the ballerina and, and, and Petrushka, she's walking like I do. I'm sorry, a lot better than I walk. Very agile. But he, he's on strings. He's like this. He can't believe how agile she is. He keeps staring at her. And so, in a way, of course, there's no words. She's like constantly like, how do you do that? How, how are you like you are? And, and then also, she started turning her eye toward the moor. And she's flirting. Everybody usually says the ballerina is she's flirting with the moor. She's dealing with Petrushka. This story about Petrushka is about Petrushka, not the moor. He's, he's been looking at it from the moment she came out of the box, and, and so she, he's, she's going to show him. And so she does this. This is you, pet. This is me. And then she does everything she can do. She does a one and a half gainer. I don't know what they call it. But whatever dancers can do in ballet, she's going to do it. And it's going to be choreographed. It's a show off in the middle. And then it's back to, here's you, Pat. This is you. So don't get overly, you don't have to do that. First of all, the top F is going to come out louder anyway. So I, in a way, I want them to play it like Jacobs would suggest. So I play the lower notes louder. Nice and full, big sound, so that you're sitting way in the back, and your mezzo forte is very soloistic, more even. And, and that, if you have that visual concept of the colors changing, uh, you, you can see what you're trying to do. And of course, the promenade is, is the same way. You want those colors. Ba, 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 ba. Not having something jump out. Jump out. That wasn't his idea. The guy is going, he's going through the gallery, art gallery. He doesn't trip. You know, he doesn't stumble, he doesn't slow down. You know, it's, it's a promenade. So there's a lot of ways to make an assessment if you're playing. And I'm going to tell you right now, your progress on the trumpet or any instrument is governed by that, not your teacher and how much they love you and what they give, they write out a plan for you every day. They, they don't have to do that. Their ears to tell you what you're missing, encouragement, they're like your parents, there are a lot of things, but don't make them plan out your future. You be in charge of your own future, and the best way is to have this list, which has a number of pieces that you need to work on, in the order of, the, of most important, and those are the ones you must do once, maybe twice a day, each time you practice this stuff. And it, you only have to make this much growth every day. They're long-term growths. Now, when you get down to number 23 through 60, they're maintenance. It's stuff you already know how to do. You're good at it. You can go da 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 but you better keep it up, or you're going to lose your double time, or your triple time, or whatever it is that's is better for you. Um, and, and that's basically what you do every day. You can't do it all every day, but if you keep right on it, and you stick with stuff, it, it's amazing. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to sit down first. And there's one guy over here, OSU, you're going to play for me in a second. So don't give it up. Keep your chops being scared, and your brain being scared. OK, I have a student, and, and he wouldn't mind me telling you this. And he, he's, uh, 
just finished his junior year. His name is Michael Chen. When he auditioned for us, he was the hottest thing. Every school wanted him. Number one, he's got great technique, incredible musician when he was young, and, and still is, incredible, and brilliant. A brilliant person. And of course, in his audition for us, and he couldn't play the high C in the Nesco Legend, he said, well, I just had an injury. Well, he lied. Um, but we, we believed him, because he had all the other skills. So during his freshman year, he's only one undergrad that we had. All the others are grads, and all of them are extremely talented with upper range, what Michael didn't have. And it's really bothering him. And he, he talks to every one of them, finds out their theories and their methods and stuff, and he's, he is so confused. And I constantly, like I do with all my students, I say, okay, so you study with uh, Tom Couples, uh, and so um, he gave you fundamentals to do, right, every day. And Michael lied. He suggested he had a routine. And I don't want to touch a routine when somebody is really entrenched in uh, their teacher, their previous teacher's routine that they taught them. So I, I went along with that. He gets to his sophomore year. There's no, no improvement. In fact, it, it's sort of affecting his tone, certainly his psyche. So at the end of his sophomore year, he tried something very interesting because I had told him about this simple phenomenon of being consistent in what you practice and what you're trying to improve on, that it'll reap benefits. So he didn't get into a festival that summer, and he did. Stayed at home, and uh, twice a day, he practiced with a lot of rest in between. He, he did simple things, and he had a lot of growth, and he played, he, got, he won the spot, he got to play Firebird with the top orchestra, Stravinsky. It's one thing, yeah, pop, 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 could play the high Bs, made tremendous growth. Um, and then he freaked out, and three days before he got a cold sore. So I'm a good teacher about cold sores, because I get herpes cold sores. I've gotten them all my life. Every day I take a preventive, Sovrac, uh, Zovrax, it's got another name now, Cyclovir. And so he's, he's also prone to get those, and it came because of stress, playing too hard, not trusting himself at the last minute, and so he didn't even get to play all of it. He had to have an assistant on the concert, which you know, really messed with him. Um, that, so that was the beginning of his junior year. And then beginning of the second semester, just, just this last winter, I again said, Michael, what do you do every day? What, what, are, what is your routine? What do you do? He said, well, Mr. Geyer, to be perfectly honest, I don't have one. I, I trusted you and said, I need fundamentals. Michael has cried in probably 10 lessons. He's like my son. I really care for him. And I want him to have, he wants to be able to play like Phil Smith. He wants to, he, he's got a great ear, he's a great musician, he's got all that. Good articulation, right? doesn't have the strength in the high notes and stuff like that. So. I wrote out, he said, would you write something out? I said, of course. I, I could have done that beginning of your freshman year. I wrote it all out. And the, pont, the principles were start simple, middle register, do a brief warm up on your mouthpiece. A brief, 10 seconds. There's a lot of people I know and respect in this world, they don't warm up. They're always right there. Bass trombone in, in the Houston Symphony, amazing. Uh, he, he, somebody asked him about his warm. I said, well, I really don't, sort of always there. I don't need to, I'm not proposing that. Some people get away with that. But you're not gonna spend hours warming up. It's not the practice routine. Your goals in a warm up are to just get yourself ready to go. Getting all your techniques, getting your range, uh, soft, any kind of articulation response, you name it. The, actually, the five basic techniques, that's what you're trying to warm up. In other words, getting back what you can do. You don't play long tones in a warm up. How many people play long tones in a warm up? Get your hands down, don't ever do that again. Long tones are isometrics. It's like doing this, holding your leg out. How many people run? Do you warm up doing that with your legs? Stretch. 
Long tones are phenomenal for endurance. Do it at the end of the practice session. Phenomenal. But it will waste you doing them correctly when you warm up. And what's the reason? Because you want to be able to hear your tone? For God's sake, you can hear your tone. Playing da-da-da-da, you can hear your tone. You don't have to sit there and go up against a wall and go, da da <laughs> little anal there. You know? So I, I don't recommend long tones to warm up. I, mean, I don't care what you do. I'm just, I, I don't recommend it. I want you to understand what they're for. Yeah. What warm up would you recommend? I'm getting to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brief, brief uh, mouthpiece to make sure the lips are vibrating. First thing, middle register. It's easiest. And then I, as soon as possible, I want to cover a little range. It's amazing how quickly you can get warmed up. Why don't I do it on the trumpet? Because sometimes I sound terrible in the morning on the trumpet. This is okay. I can't tell if I'm having a bad day or not. So I start with a mouthpiece. And that's about all I do. I might play a tune. And try to make sure I can get the note. That's about it. Now, I launch into practicing fundamentals. So first thing, the very first thing you should do is check yourself that if you're fundamentally sound, a beautiful spin in your tone, clear, akura, sound, beautiful, easy production, and simple flirt. Making sure you stay on that uh, peach color light that Jacobs has. One color. Don't look back there. I told you about the line of colors that he had. Don't let there be, don't let it jump around. And make sure it's molto legato. That's another thing we try to copy from singers. Molto legato. Not perfect. Don't, don't air attack any of them. Don't let anything jump out. Molto smooth. It only takes maybe about 10 seconds to check that each day. You got that? Move on to the next thing, which is expanding that same thing in range, going up a little bit higher and a little bit lower. Not an octave. Stick with uh, shorter lengths. Now, don't get rid of tonguing. So very soon, add the tongue in there. Get it going right away. gradually down low and high at the same time. Make sure you're covering your range as soon as possible. Don't put it off. Don't put off articulation. Start going then with uh, a small, short arpeggios. Slurred and tongue. So, um, of any kind. Major. Even. that's perfectly smooth and all those downward slurs, they're singing right through, connected, to make sure you're beautiful and everything. That's what fundamentals are. Fundamentally sound, whatever you practice, and you're constantly expanding, and you're eventually going to do one octave scales. It's the best way of learning range. And if you want a quick way, you basically do, you start mezzo forte with a diminuendo up the top note and slow down, and then you crescendo on the way down. Don't make it harder by playing the high notes loud. That spreads your lips apart. Play them at a volume that where you're successful. I guarantee you, you're going to have an incredible increase in your range if you do your scales that way. Three times, minimum. Start off slurring only. <laughs> Endurance be part of your daily routine. Rest sufficiently. Work that up 
after resting, higher and higher and higher. Keep track of where your note is, the one you own. Make sure you do it every time you practice. If you can practice twice a day, it's great. I wrote this routine out for Michael Chen. Eventually, I told him to do the same scales and down a fifth as loud as possible. Down a fifth. As loud as he could play. Then I had him doing big intervals. Lots of different ways. Sorry. Every key. But he only has to do one or two of those each day a different way, a different form. Slurring down, slurring up. He did a lot of that. Then I had him do loop, loop trills. Flutter tongue slurred scales. What's, our, what's so good about flutter tongue slurring? Um, it helps move the air. Like if you have something... No. <clears throat> George? Uh, you can see how your air flow is, like if you have it halted. What happens when we flutter tongue? Does anybody in here think that we arch our tongue when we play higher? Were you going to have the right answer? Flutter tonguing slurred scales makes you stronger incredibly. You know why? Because you can't arch your tongue, and yes, we do. Okay. Uh, Arnold Jacobs said we don't arch our tongue. How would, how would he know that? Tube player. Tube player, and how would he know, though? It's really hard to feel. So here's the story. So I'm going to get back to Michael Chen. So here's my story. When I was down at Houston Symphony and Dave Waters was a bass trombone, uh, he asked me, came up and said, now, there's this school further south. Boy, it's hard to get further south than Houston. Um, they want us to come and do just a little short class, and they, and they just would like us to come down there to their music school. I'll do it. Why don't we play something together? We played the Stravinsky fanfare. He played trombone, I played it, so it was an octave apart. And we talked a little while, and then a guy in a white smock came up and said, now if you two would follow me, we walked outside got into a van and went over to the dentistry school. And they put, I went first, they put on a, from here to my ankles, uh, what would it be, lead to block x-rays, a lead coat. Said, now, this list of things I want you to play, you must do in 40 seconds. So get it quickly. You are going to be videotaped x-ray. Okay. Whoa. So I did, and, and there were scales, two octave scales, articulation, intervals, a lot of stuff. A lot of different things. Flutter tongue, lip trills, lip slurs. Of course, when you do a lip, a lip trill, there's, your lip's not working, is it? It's not doing anything, right? You all know that? What's moving? Tongue. Your tongue. You're like on a fence, and you're pivoting back and forth. You might start learning that by doing lip slurs. But, uh, we're now in a day where you don't need to do lip trills because we have E-flat trumpets that can do finger trills. <laughs> when I was a kid, I played this often on my C trumpet. I can't play lip slurs, my crap, sorry. Um, Cantata 51 on a C trumpet. I played it probably 50 times, and it's a long lip trill there. And there's this no way of getting around. You're playing a broke trumpet. What are they doing? Lip trills. <laughs> the humble trumpet concerto, the end of the first movement, there's no other way to do it. You gotta do that. You gotta do the lip trill. Unless you use it in the flat trumpet. Okay, so I did mine. I came out, Dave Waters put in the lead jacket. We're gonna quit some, except you're gonna play. Um, and um, so we then they had a reel-to-reel -reel tape that they, had, we got back in the van, they, they brought the tape, we went into the big auditorium where we had played, I sat down and put it on, and, and uh, right off the bat, I play a scale, and you can see in varying degrees of gray, you can see the back of my tongue, right at the scale. And I slunk down, is that a word? Slunk down. I was so embarrassed, because I'd always heard that we don't, from Arnold Jacobs teaching in Chicago, not as a private student, but just one of his philosophies, you know. You don't arch your tongue. Uh, Mark Reidenauer swears he doesn't arch your tongue. I bet he does. 
It's a tremendous aid. It reduces the aperture in your back part of your mouth, like we do with the embouchure. So uh, uh, way back in, in the day, by the way, I was so embarrassed. I watched that whole video. I wanted to crawl out of the room because it showed exactly why I would never be a Maynard Ferguson or a great player like a Maurice Andre or anybody because I arched my tongue. I felt terrible. David Waters went next. Thank you, David. He arched his tongue too. Maurice Andre finally, at the end of his life, agreed to be videotaped. It's on YouTube. He arches his tongue. He's not alive anymore, so he doesn't do it now. But So if we agree with that, guess what happens when we flutter tongue? The flutter either stops or the tongue arching stops. One of them is going to stop. So here's what you hear. That's what, that's what you hear. You can't play a scale even a fourth lower than you can play. It's pathetic. You sound like you're in third grade. So what do you do to make it happen? You use more aperture, more strength. And you do those slurred scales like that, and you get good at it, I'm going to tell you, you're going to, it's going to make you stronger. Chickowitz used to teach slurred, flutter tongue scales. And I finally figured out why. That's, that's the reason. So you put all these things on that list. Finish Michael Chimp. Okay, I gave him this list. He started basic to really get it good, and then we, I kept adding things. I met with him twice a day. I wouldn't let him play. He wasn't playing in the ensemble. He's playing second on some Haydn uh, symphony. That's all, because he, again, was injured over playing at one of our auditions. We have auditions constantly for the casting of, of, of the parts. And so he was perfect. He was free. This was last, Febu uh, last January, February. And I met with him twice a day for 10 days. Sundays, I would pick him up at his, where he was living, and even when it was raining. And we sat and we played together, back and forth, 40 minutes uh, to an hour. Um, it got to the point where he said, Mr. Geyer, I I'm going to tell you exactly, genuinely, this is magic to me. He plays a double G. Loud. A double G on a C trumpet. That's where he got with his strength. It's astounding. He got it in time where he could actually play all the licks in Alpine Symphony, which we did at the end of the year. And he didn't embarrass himself. He could play everything in Alpine Symphony. It was astounding. I just assumed, it was my fault, I assumed he was doing something and it wasn't working. But once we put him on a routine that was so regular, Remember, all you need is three days in a row and you're going to call me up, Mr. Geyer, it's magic. <laughs> and you're on your way. But a lot of you are just haphazard. You just pick up your horn, oh gee, what am I going to play today? Well, i got to learn this, this, and that. And you don't work on your techniques. That's, that's as simple as it. It's your responsibility, period. Not your teachers. You play. And then we'll, then we'll stop. I'll say a couple things after you play, unless you're perfect. No. <laughs> It's nice to have that. that but it's nice to have that. You can always learn. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Ian Murtis, and I will be playing the opening. Time. You don't have to do that, right? You don't have to do that. No. Like an emphatic. My name is Horn my behind name. you. Don't even <clears throat> gesture with like you're going to orate, you know, the, the Gettysburg Address or something, <laughs> or score. My name is Ian Murtis, and I will be playing the opening solo to Molly. Don't stop! Keep going, less vibrato.
you're, you're better than you, you even played that. So, but you sat there for a long time. And you know, it's all right. You could do it. You could still do it. But you, we have to work a little harder on our technique when we're not perfectly warmed up, you know, bad lip, or whatever. OK, so it didn't work. I'm sorry. I, of course, and you expected it to. And for those that don't have good clarity here, number one, it's the worst note on the C trumpet. It's a low C sharp. Guess what it is? It's like a Baroque trumpet. You know that? You're using all the tubing here. You get a Baroque trumpet, and you try to play the lower notes in the Principale range, they black. They spread. They sound terrible. It's really hard to make them centered, like this. So you can do a bunch of things. You can start with <coughs> clarity. start a G and, and that you can start on the low C sharp and then you might try that trick where you've actually think and felt that you just played it three times. And it's easier because you know that's why I said don't stop. That's what you got, yeah. didn't you? Right. Make the adjustment at the beginning <laughs> rather than waiting until you miss it. So be more aggressive in that articulation. Only spit it out. With clarity, refine it. Do it again. Okay, good. And, and of course, you're going to impress people if you can actually start piano, but how long are you piano? Oh, very long. Yeah, it's, it's a crescendo right away. And you're way in the back. Person never played it softly. You know, he just never, never did. But clear. And always right there, too. All right, why do you want to? This isn't a mariachi tune. Don't put such wide vibrato. Think of it as spin. Okay? It, it, it's the wrong. What's going on here? What's this called here? Funeral procession. Thank you. Funeral procession. And this little statement up here, you know, it's, it's really good to learn all these things. In the promenade, by the way, it says, um, um, what is it, Andante? No, what's the first one? Andante. You have a promenade? Okay. Allegro. Allegro means what? Allegro. No, it's lively. Sorry. No. Vivace means lively. So this is what Jason probably remembers when I went through the terms. <laughs> lively is Vivace, or Lebhaft if it's German. That's lively. Okay. Allegro means what? You guys are going to be blown away with this. Allegro is what? Huh? No, presto's fast. Modern? Nothing to do with fast. There's out of the nine terms we use, largo, adagio, grave, uh, what's the other one? Lento. Uh, lento. Only one means slow. It's lento. Only one. Then moderato means moderate, doesn't it? Presto means fast. There's only three out of the nine. All the others are sort of a character. A mood. Allegro means happy, joyful. How about that? All these years and nobody bothered to tell you. You can just go to Italy. Hey, buddy, are you Allegro? <laughs> Dolce is a, you know, you know, a candy store. They sell gelato. You see a big sign in Florence, Italy, or Rome, gelato. Allegro, happy, joyful, justo. Does that mean with gusto? No. It means just right. Correct. Justo. Just right. How about that? So he says right off the bat, a joyful, just right tempo. If you check your metronome, you're going to find that between 89 and 92, you can't go faster and you can't go slower. That's the tempo it's supposed to be. Or you're going to sound a little odd. Yes, Hurston played it with Reiner probably at 84. It was the slowest ever recorded, and it was monumental. But this promenade, and then he says, nel modo russico. In a Russian mo uh, mode or character, 
that we don't understand anymore, but certainly Mussorgsky did. And if we'd studied Boris Kudinov, maybe we'd get even more of a sense of what that meant. Without Allegretta, without being too happy, or fast if you want to say it, ma poco sostenuto, but a little, what sostenuto mean? All right, that's the word everybody says, but okay, multiple choice. Sostenuto means long, long notes, slower, or playing with a smile on your face while you're playing. I'm kidding, come on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it's not that one. And it's not playing longer. All the composers, Andante Sostenuto, Andante Sostenuto is the beginning of, of Czech Four. It's fanfare. It's, it's slower than Andante. It's not meant to be da 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 da. Somebody brought up uh, Oberon, and it says the same thing. It says uh, Sostenuto. It's a fanfare. Bum, ba, 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 ba. You don't play it long. Da 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 da. This is not, yes, there are long notes here. He says, without going fast, but a little slow. It's like a play on words here. He's basically saying there's a perfect tempo, so don't mess with it. And if you would study what Rusiko is, that's it. So let's go back to Mahler. Here he says, in a measured, strict, strong, as a conduct. What's a conduct? Not as though it's conducted. Conduct in German is a train, a choo-choo train. Once you get a choo-choo train going, you're not going to make moves. So in other words, it's a funeral march, so it's steady as can be. And the trumpet should be brilliant. You should have given it to the drum, because this is what it is. Funerals in those days, there was a drummer that marched along with the processional. Takatang, pakatang, takatang, for a mile out to the cemetery. Takatang, everybody marched to that. That was a processional. Takatang, same temple. Same volume. No. You're supposed to get off that note. Forzando, if you look at this piece, every first or third beat, except two, I'm sorry, three, one, two, three, all the others have a forzando, diminuendo, accent, or maybe a forte piano. All of them. In other words, get off that sucker. Let it just let it ring. But don't sit there and go, da -da -da -da. this is not a, this is not a concerto. Some people say, um, can I play the solo from Mahler 5? It's not a solo. It's a processional. It's a death march. Okay. Don't do that. That's got to be your first really loud note. I want to hear the cymbal crash on that high A. So you're ba, ba, ba. That's where Mahler, who was seeing his own funeral, he was seeing his, his own funeral. That's when he, he sort of realizes it's there, it's right there. It's almost like he watches the procession from a couple blocks away and it's getting closer and closer and then right here he's like, that's me in the coffin. He's been looking at it from the second floor above the drugstore. And he, and he screams in terror. Now, you stay forte, this is a straight note, ba, ba, you backed off, this was all forte. This is a peak, you don't have to make the crescendo, but it's ba, ba, this is loud, ba. And then you back off to one F. Okay? And of course that was too bad. You need to practice. Really be able to nail it. That's supposed to be louder than everything else, that low A. So like, like the ballerina, like the promenade, there's a bunch of projects. You could practice them individually rather than getting uh, um, um, impatient and wanting to play the piece. We all do that but instead becoming a, an expert on these little, little bit projects, okay? So you want to own that triplet, because you could do it. So start it again, and then we're going to say goodbye. Imagine you just played it twice. It didn't quite work the first two times. And when you get to the third one, you make the adjustment. <laughs> Don't play too loud. No, I'm giving you five. <laughs> <laughs> There's no overall crescendo here. Did you ever notice that? This is that same drummer. Okay, that 
da, this doesn't get louder. Da, 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 it's just a little bit longer. Same thing. Da, 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 da. There's no crescendo here. There's a crescendo here. This is over these notes. So play this grouping louder. Da, 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 da. Only two forte, get down. And then this is all forte with accents. I like you kept the tempo. Thank you. Phil Smith said in one of those tapes he did about his about playing at various accents, he said, Do not follow my Zoom and made a recording because he made me go faster right there. And so many people did follow it and they get nailed because it's a procession. You can't change the tempo. And you you stayed steady, and I really appreciated that. So in that part, you start sort of creating a good movie, a character. The first thing he said in the measured, strict, strong, as a choo-choo train. That's all he said. And then at the bottom, you know, he says a thing about the triplets. It's supposed to be like a military fanfare. So it's not just faster. It's yeah, ba ba ba, ba 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 ba. It's supposed to rush, right? So you just went da 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 da, and you sort of climb the note in the middle there. It went too fast. Um, so. Be very specific on this piece. This is one of the most asked for pieces because it's profound. And, and it requires a lot of skills, especially that first articulation without that. But break it apart. Ever, anybody ever hear the concept of practicing slowly? Who wants to do that? Come on, be real. Who wants to do that? We, we got to get on with life, right? You, where, what, practice slowly? I hated that thing. Boy, does it work. It's amazing. Practice slowly and practice the little bitty things. Any quick question, then we're going to call it a, a day. I didn't have dinner yet. Yes? So earlier you uh, talked about, I know this is going back a little bit, you talked about endurance not being part of our, our practicing. When should we work on endurance? Endurance is a, is a byproduct of practicing. And there's probably 83 different endurances, right? There's endurance to get through the first page and a half of the end of the first moment. Let's stop. Get through that bright section. By the way, you know, it says bright there. Ba da ba da ba. What does bright mean in Italian? Sostenuto. It's slower there. It's not broader. Da 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 da. Yes, it's long notes. Ba 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 ba. Because at the end of that long note, it says as before or as in the beginning. Vian Fong or something, I can't remember exactly what it says, but it's a tempo. So uh, that's an endurance. It's an endurance to get through the Brandenburg. If you're playing correctly, it should be, it should be a piece of cake. You're not even playing 10 minutes. But most people, it's, uh, it's there, it's really difficult. But that's a different kind of endurance, isn't it? Getting through your practice session, if you start gradually, like we did with, like I showed you with Michael Chen, by the time at the end of the week, he was doing almost everything that was on his list. He was triple tonguing, double tonguing, playing extremely loud, big intervals, fast stuff. He was playing everything. He was trying to incorporate all the techniques that he could think of. And at the end of 10 days, I said, you're on your own. We didn't meet anymore. And I'm going to trust that you keep up with this and keep adding more and more things. And he's doing great. He's, he's now he's practicing a lot of poo attacks, which Chris Martin talks about, and the benefits of that. Um, He's a very smart guy, and it's going to happen. And that it's that routine. He did it. So the endurance. If you're going to play, let's say you asked that question. If you're going to, let's say you're asked to play in the circus uh, next week, you're going to play uh, six shows circus. I don't know of a harder thing to play because it's a small group of six, and you play the melody all the time. You play those marches, you don't stop. Get you in the clarinet. Nobody hears the clarinet. Uh, it's it's unbelievably difficult. Five times more difficult than a brass quintet concert playing all first or play even splitting the book. But you would build up to that. Because if you just jumped right in and played that, you'd probably hurt yourself. So if you have something in mind, like you're going to play a brass quintet concert in a month, you have in mind that it's probably going to be about an hour and a half with a break. You start practicing that way. You make sure that you're, whatever practicing you're doing, you're doing at least an hour with a lot of resting. And you gradually reduce the resting. Endurance, a synonym, is quick recovery. When you're out of shape, right off the bat, I mean, when you're really out of shape, right off the bat, you can play high notes because your lips are really thin, no muscle in there, and then you're gone. You're, you're done in 10 seconds. <laughs> you're, you're finished. And you can't play right away again. I mean, you're like beat up. 
you gotta wait almost uh, three hours before you can do it again because you have no recovery. Recovery is, is letting the abuse happen because it is abusive and then quickly recovering to the point where you can play through a whole Charlier with only a couple beats of rest here and there. And, and you can plan out that conditioning. It's a little bit involved thing, but it's not just a generic quick answer. So playing through a Mahler symphony is different than actually playing through a Bruckner symphony even, and certainly a, a Beethoven. <coughs> okay, you've been all wonderful. I, I really was motivated. Okay. Okay, Chigoitz was really good with fundamentals, mainly because even though he only <coughs> probably worked on maybe three, slurring was really important, smooth slurring. And he didn't cover a lot of range in his daily routine, and he didn't do much articulation. But his, all of his students sounded so healthy, incredibly healthy. So that was, he, that was a major step pedagogically for the trumpet world in, in his very calm, Routine and it had to do with the same kind of routine. My only question was, uh, it didn't include enough stuff. You'd spend 45 minutes and you'd never get out of the staff. Ba da 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 da. He sort of put that together. I never got that. That was after me. Um, and uh, Rex Martin, who taught tuba there until just now, sort of uh, also recognized that there was a limitation. So he used to walk down the hallway when I first started. I can't get out of the staff. That's what he said. <laughs> I won't play high notes just yet. Tonguing <laughs> <laughs> takes much longer to stop. He would see all that, and there was truth to it. They, but they got, they, that's all they would do. All the students did that. That's all they, he didn't do that with me. He changed as he got older and wasn't, wasn't playing anymore. And he got to where air and smooth legato playing was, and he would do two attacks. It was another thing that he taught a lot. So um, I love Vince Jiglitz. He was very calming to me. The biggest thing he taught me was that if I practiced, I would improve. <laughs> and, and he had such a calming way of speaking that everybody had confidence in him, and they, they would do that. I just had to, I had to expand on what I practiced more, and that's what I'm challenging you guys to do. Okay, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I have bad news for you. I'm coming back tomorrow, <laughs> and we're going to do it again at 8 o'clock, and then again tomorrow night. The same stuff. You're going to be so bored with me. <laughs> so, actually, that's not true. So I am playing. I think we're going to play tomorrow. We're doing a sort of a little bit of mini, mini recital. Make sure to pray for me. Um, I thought I could play the trumpet, but I had a rehearsal with Robert. Robert? Yeah. Today, it's, it's so embarrassing. So maybe with some more rest. I, I'll be fine. So, anyway, hope to see you tomorrow. And I really wish I could play that baseball game with y'all. And uh, good luck to y'all. Best wishes in your future. <laughs>